So Nueva Esperanza accompaniment teams is a program that is really that is for recently arrived immigrants. Usually we're working with families, but sometimes individuals. And we specifically intend to work with families that don't have other family or friends. Um, excuse me. That don't have family or friends as a support network in the Bay Area. So we highlight that part of it because our intention there is really to fill the gap. Often when people immigrate here, they're immigrating and join other people from their community, even if that's a distant connection, it's somebody that they can come to and connect with when they, for their first stages of resettling. And we are trying to fill the gap for people that don't have someone to come to. As such, we want to create some stability so that a strong relationship is formed. And so we ask for a six month commitment if people are going to be a part of Nueva Esperanza. And it is an intensive volunteer experience. So even though it's not always three to four hours a week for volunteers, we want people to be prepared that there are times when it is um, it really does ask for quite a bit of your time. The model is that we ask people to form teams of five and that they be connected to a congregation. So you don't all need to be from the same congregation, but we would like there to be a congregation where um, you intend to include the congregation in your experience, share with them what it's like for you, perhaps have them get to know the family that you're accompanying um, and also make sure that you have the support of the leadership in that congregation. And ultimately the goal of Nueva Esperanza by accompanying um, recently arrived families is that it's not for us to become providers or resettle them or take responsibility for making their lives get quote unquote, get better, but it's really for them to be able to be self-sufficient. And the best way to be self-sufficient is by being aware of the resources and the supports they have in the community. So we'll be talking more about that, um, but at the end of the day, we hope that volunteers would both be, be a resource themselves where the, the families know that they can go to the congregation and to the volunteers on their team for support, but then they can also go to resources in the community um, for practical needs, such as food banks or medical care, et cetera. And this image in the middle of this slide is not, you know, you don't need to read all the details. I'm just referencing this because this is one of the intro materials that you should have reviewed when, prior to joining this training that's on our website. So if you haven't had a chance to review our intro materials, I would highly encourage you to do so. Okay. So what we like to do at the beginning of our accompaniment trainings, which we've been doing this for five years, is we break down the word accompaniment because this is a very intentional term that our organization has really been thinking about to shape the experience of both the volunteers and the immigrants. So many of you have had an experience yourselves of being accompanied and you were in a very difficult situation in a crisis, illness, a loved one passing away, and the experience of being accompanied is just feeling someone was present with you. And we would like to know if anybody, um, if you've ever thought about the root words of where accompaniment is. And when we break down the root words, you see that there's com, which is Latin for along with. There's also pan, bread in Latin, and panis is another root for face. So it's this, the accompaniment root word, when we pause to reflect, it's this beautiful um, word that describes the experience of sharing a nourishing 
or sharing something with someone. There's equality, walking along with someone. We also want to see that bread is a sense of nourishment. And sometimes when we are in a moment of crisis, people are thirsting or yearning for someone to just be there with them. And that's why we also like this image of sharing bread with one another. And I'd like to take a moment to just kind of share with you when I first started the Nueva Esperanza accompaniment program, an experience that really helped me to understand what it meant when it comes to working with volunteers and immigrants. So this was in 2016, soon after the presidential elections, I met a Guatemalan family who were seeking accompaniment. The mother and child had just crossed um, the US and were recently released from detention and meeting their, the husband who has already been working here um, for many years, but still, um, due to his seeking asylum process and his current, and then not being able to find work, he didn't have a house for them. And that's how we got to meet them through a church that they go to, a Presbyterian church in, that they go to. And while we were trying to find accompaniment for this family, there's a couple who were part of a Jewish congregation who were so touched by what was going on in the current political elections, as well as the current immigration situations that they said, we would like to join this accompaniment team and also offer a room that we have to give them a temporary emergency housing so they won't be homeless, this family. So they had been there, a month goes in and I go visit and we're, we're having dinner. And I ask the yeah. husband from Guatemala, yeah his experience and he tells me that when he it is beyond what he had imagined for example and he couldn't really describe it into words so he gave me this example when they invite me to dinner today I just thought they were going to give I was going to talk to you for 10 minutes and then I was going to get handed a slice of pizza on a paper plate but what, to my surprise is that you all had a dinner prepared for me, waited for me to arrive from work. And I have two slices, two options of different pizzas to choose from and my family is here sitting. It's more than what I imagined. And to that, it really touched my heart because this is accompaniment. It's more than what we can imagine for, this, for the immigrants, for the volunteers as well when I asked them. You know, it was more than what they imagined. They, were very nervous, hesitant at the beginning to offer their Jewish couple, elderly, with the young Guatemalan Presbyterian family, you know what's gonna happen, same for me, but it's more than what we imagine. And accompaniment invites us to be creative because creative creativity comes when we see that we are equal in their respect. And we hope that through our organization, we encourage congregations and people of faith to realize that there's a charity model where there's the receivers and um, the givers, but the accompany model is two people walking alongside in their both experiences is valid. So as I mentioned, uh, there is a lot of gray area in accompaniment and one of the gray areas is how to define it. So my best way of defining it is this quote that actually one of our volunteers said. So I'd love if anyone, whoever wants to, can unmute themselves and read this out loud for the group, please. I'll read it. We have to walk beside and be with people in order to really understand. We can't really walk in other people's shoes, but we can walk next to them very closely to pay attention and offer our accompaniment unconditionally. To not expect gratitude or acknowledgement or a meaningful relationship. We grow together. That's what it's about. Thank you. Was that Helen? Yes, Helen. Thank you. Thank you. So, what really stands out to me about this is again, this emphasis about growing, growing together. 
without expectations other than to just be present company and witnesses to each other's lives. That being said, there are also guidelines to strive for, which is which are the points that we're going to be presenting. But at the end of the day, accompaniment is not about accomplishing something or um, some form of something, some sort of thing you're producing at the end of the relation, at the end of the time accompanying each other. It's because often we are tempted to orient ourselves toward what makes accompaniment a success. And what makes it a success is simply the experience of doing it. The family themselves will determine what makes it successful. Um, and because we want to center the, ex we want accompaniment to be about uh, what the family hoped for. And if we're accomplishing being, walking alongside them toward their goals, not what we think we should be doing for them. Accompaniment. So the first thing we're going to be talking about are the outcomes. In other words, what are we hoping for? Why do we do accompaniment? So we like to name three different outcomes. One is the work of justice. One is creating community. And another is for spiritual growth. Um, through all of these, again, as we mentioned, we hope for transformation. So you probably noticed in our very long organizational name that we are the Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity. And there is a reason that we call ourselves a movement, which is that we are part of a movement for people to be treated as we believe our different faiths um, Sorry. Collectively, collectively think they should be treated. Uh, Zooming out um, transformation that takes place across all these different realms that both volunteers and families experience fits into this larger vision of transforming society. Because when you experience internal transformation, you then hopefully will be motivated to get involved in more advocacy work which are part of the other programs that our organization offers. So for example, some ongoing opportunities that our volunteers get involved in are talking to the governor to shut down detention centers or attending regional monthly coalition meetings with like-minded uh, faith leaders who organize together for change. And then what Lupita is going to be doing and people can get involved in are organizing freedom campaigns to help protect undocumented people from deportation. So let's zoom back in now to the, how does this transfer taking, trans, transformation take place by creating justice, community and spiritual growth in accompaniment? Okay, so the first outcome, as we mentioned, is justice. Obviously, one of my personal motivations for being part of this accompaniment program is because I see so much social injustice that has happened that we want to respond. And especially our organization has been responding since 2015, when there was an increase of more migrants from Central America to the United States, and also an increase of migrants from around the world to the US but they were being caught in detention increasingly. Um, and this helped us to think about, well, have the question like, well, why are people migrating? You know, what is the root causes? And we've learned that in a large part through some of um, stories that we've heard through some of the delegations we've taken to, for example, to Honduras, that our country has a large part in the push and pull factors because of the government of how our country is involved in their government and the economy that are pushing people, literally forcing people to flee to survive. So from this perspective, 
um, with our concept of justice is actually fulfilling a responsibility that we have living here in this country to make amends for our country's part for the root causes for their flights. Another aspect of justice that we are hoping for is recognizing that our immigration system is designed to criminalize immigrants and justice would be offering a humane alternative to this immigration system by welcoming them through accompaniment. So what do we mean when we say people are criminalized? To criminalize someone means you are treating them as suspect, illegal, lawbreaker, inhuman, or in other ways using laws and practices to treat them that way. Our immigration system does that by only allowing a very narrow portion of, of people who are immigrating here to be allowed, quote unquote, in because the others are considered not worthy. You can see that in our current policies that are essentially banning asylum seekers. They are not following the international law to, um, to allow for asylum centers. If you just want to name anything quick, anything off the top of your head, what feels like criminalized uh, immigrants are being criminalized to you? Someone wrote Trump. That's a good one. The wall, putting handcuffs on asylum seekers. Yes. Locking people up at the border, banning them from entering because they went to another country before they went here, separating kids from their parents, felony charge for re-entry, mistreatment in detention centers, calling people rapists, illegal aliens, no access to health services and others. So I think we get the idea. It's pretty rampant, right? Naming all of these gives us a very accurate perception of what our immigration system actually is. And many, many people are ignorant to the details of this immigration system. The perspective we want you to hear is that people are fleeing their country often due to persecution and oppression. The journey is hard enough because coyotes, which are the people who generally get, get paid to get them here, exploit them, as well as people taking advantage of them on the journey, which is very dangerous. And people may be prepared in some ways for the dangers of that journey, but what people are not prepared for is that this is just the tip of the iceberg. They generally, have the perspective that once they get across the border, things are going to be relatively rosy compared to the journey here, or relatively rosy compared to what they're coming from. It People are often shocked when they get here and instead they're incarcerated in detention centers, separated from their loved ones, and have to prove that they have someone in the United States to sponsor them out, someone to receive them. In other words, they can't get out just because they want to get out. They don't expect to be treated as criminals they, because they thought they would be welcomed as refugees. And as far as they're aware, they're doing what they're supposed to do. They're asking for their basic human right to asylum. So really at the end of the day, we're asking is the criminal, the person asking for their basic human right to be listened to, or is the criminal the law, the people making the laws in the country that are abusing those human rights? We're hoping to seek justice by providing humane alternatives that welcome them in opposition to the punitive punishment they're receiving when they're treated as criminals as the US abuses their right to asylum.
Another area that we're hoping to change, uh, create justice is by changing the narratives and myths about immigrants. So what do we mean by that? So what can we do? You know, this is really thinking about the justice that each one of us who are in this experience of accompaniment. So one of the biggest ways is changing the narratives and the myths about immigrants is really one of the key steps of making a change. And it's often overlooked. People often go to policies and changes, and that is a goal. But the first way is changing the narrative. And so by walking alongside with someone, you start to understand more the resources that people don't have at, uh, access to. You start understanding the racism be underneath the policies of a person seeking asylum, of a person who was born in the US and um, had a, sm a very small misdemeanor criminal and then now is in, at risk of being deported to a country he may not come up. And all of these actually come from this white supremacy culture that is reflected in the media and the policies that has sustained this system way before even this current presidential campaign. Um, and so we want you all to realize that with accompaniment, you will start learning where these myths are coming from. You will start to understand that who is really the victim and vulnerable are the people who don't have the privilege to say this is unfair because they don't feel like they have a voice in this country. So justice is also actually first ourselves deconditioning or actually addressing those myths and the stereotypes in our congregations about what they think they know about immigrants but really until you get to know someone and walk alongside will they know and like this is how we will be able to make change in the community. Um, we are hoping to build community. And when we build community, what this really does is change the dynamic of how our current society um, might see accompaniment. Many people, if they are volunteering with uh, with recently arrived immigrants, might see themselves as the giver and the the immigrant as the receiver. Even if they themselves are immigrants because they're coming from a position of having more time here perhaps or more experience, they, the concept is still giver and receiver. And what we're hoping for is to do away with that notion by having people come together um, in community. We change that dynamic by creating this more inclusive community and the inclusion really comes by way of our various faith communities. It's humanizing to bring in people that have been persecuted and are excluded by our society as they adopt, adapt to a new place. And the way it's, it's humanizing is that it creates relationships, resources and safety. Sometimes people fall into the trap of accompaniment becoming transactional. You need this and we're gonna find it for you. Or from the opposite perspective, I being accompanied am only gonna go to you when I need something. And that's the dynamic we don't want to have because that maintains us in the giver and receiver relationship. We really want to find ways to build community and relationship in non-transactional ways, AKA have fun. So another aspect of community is gaining access to resources. Again, this is one of the main focuses of accompaniment because this really leads to that idea of self-sufficiency. So what do we mean by this? Um, every in, in Nueva Esperanza, every family creates their own goals that they're working toward. And the team accompanies them and is their support network towards those goals. But then we have the congregation behind the team. So the congregation at the same time is the support network and encouraging the team working towards those goals. What makes the accompaniment team successful is the close collaboration 
and assured support of the local congregation. So what, do, what are some examples of how this is done? Uh, one team, for example, prayed every, together for the family during online worship every week, of course, with the family's permission to share um, their prayer requests. Um, another team has a like a group post, like a group communication among the whole congregation. And if anything arose that they could put in a specific request to the church community, for example, the, this church community had a private Facebook page and a weekly newsletter. So they could put in specific requests, like when one of our uh, one of our team, excuse me, families had a baby. They were able to organize meals to bring to the family for the first week by including the whole congregation. Um, Miriam, do you wanna share your, actually I'll share one more example. So this picture that you see of the little girl and the little boy, that's actually my daughter when I participated on an accompaniment team. And so the person we were accompanying was looking, one of their goals was to find work. And so obviously they're doing their part looking for work, but because we have the team and because we had the whole congregation behind them, we were able to use our networks to find a few side jobs for them to have some form of income. So in this case, the person built a fence for the team member. And it was really cool because when they built the fence for the team member, other neighbors started noticing and asked about it. And they ended up by word of mouth building four more fences for people in the neighborhood. And that gave them at least a month of income, which is really important, especially when you first get here sometimes. So another aspect of what comes out of community is safety for the families that we are accompanying. So what do we mean by that? We don't just mean a sense of physical safety, which is of course something that we hope for, but we meant a safe place for them to share their voice and their experiences. When, when families get to talk about what has been going on for them and what their current circumstances are, that's testimony. And no one can argue with testimony. It's very powerful for families to be heard because of everything they've gone to toward. And imagine what makes you feel welcomed, most likely getting to talk about yourself and be who you are and represent everything about who you are. So again, this is providing that welcoming alternative um, to our immigration system. Um, here we have a, actually, do you wanna share Miriam mm -hmm. picture? So the image here is an event we did a couple years ago called Rainbows Not Walls. The woman here, her name is Charlotte. She came to the US with the transgender caravan from Central America. And when she was released from detention, she committed herself to remain in touch with her other friends who remained in detention and fundraise money for the commissary accounts, like I mentioned before, so they can have access to resource um, things inside detention and to keep in touch with them. So a Jewish congregation um, made a space for her to share her story and gather a lot of other volunteers to join Friends of Fuera and write letters to folks that she was connected to. So this is an example of a person who by society from her own country had to flee her life because of who she was, is now given a space where she felt safe to talk about her experience, but through that empower and inspire mm -hmm. others to to talk um, to join her, so she became a leader, and this is a very beautiful outcome that we see when communities created around immigrants who have experienced a lot of oppression, even from their own countries and from where they're coming here. So, at the end of the day, by centering the uh, the immigrant voice and experience, 
we become the ones learning and listening as they become our educators and leaders and sources of wisdom. And in this way, their voices are lifted up and we create and, and safety is created um, whereas they were previously silenced. So our third outcome we're hoping for is spiritual growth. And this is for each person, this is very personal for each person individually. Um, there are many ways that you can grow spiritually. And this here we list a few of the ways. Someone, uh, someone raised the question of the long suffering descriptor. What did we mean by that? So oh, what we mean by that is that often there are challenges in accompaniment. Uh, they challenge ourselves because we can get to places of burnout or because they are just not what we expected. Um, and we'll talk a little more about that later, but long suffering is the idea of um, staying committed to someone, even if it means personal suffering because it's hard to stay committed when things are hard. Yeah, and this goes for both volunteers and immigrants and particularly immigrants have to deal with long suffering as from the moment they leave to their ongoing arduous attempt to get a status, find a home, get a job here. It's just the patience. It becomes a spiritual, if it's used with faith and pristine from the late lens of faith and spiritual practice, it can be an opportunity for spiritual growth. So uh, can someone unmute themselves and read this quote, please? Privilege creates spiritual and psychological damage that must be healed in order for people to bring their full contribution to God's work for justice. Thank you. Thank you. So we want to take a moment to talk about a place of privilege. And I want to speak on a little bit about my, for my behalf to talk about privilege is just a place where you have a social advantage that you um, can really use to benefit and support to advocate for others. For myself, for example, um, I am a doctor recipient, right? And from there, that could be my marginalized experience. However, the fact that I am bilingual, college educated, um, I have privileges that I can still realize that little by little can actually cause some moments of struggle and challenge when I'm working alongside with people who are new to this country, are incarcerated, or any areas of social injustice. So when we read this quote, we want to see it also from a spiritual perspective of how all of us can have an experience of privilege. However, if it's not used for the good, it can cause that gap. And that's what we are currently seeing with so many people being apathetic or just not informed about the current situation, they are not aware of how their privilege of access to resources, their social standing, um, so their race, economic status, whatever, can actually help. And we're encouraging you to see this opportunity of accompaniment as a spiritual healing to help you realize how much good your access in society can help um, for good, for justice. 